Welcome back, friends. Last guy, friends. Time for more creaking chair. Uh, great Ace Attorney. Ace Five. Let's go. Let's do the voice. Is of this thing. Let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Okay. Oh, yeah, we're looking around. We're looking around. Looking around. Let's see what else we got. A door. Three gloves of gold. Is that some sort of charm? Dear me, have you not seen this sign before? No, never. The three golden balls are in Great Britain, at least. Universal sign of a pawn brokery. Really? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know this. There we go. There are more than 700 such establishments in the capital, all showing the same sign. Oh, I see. Ah, I had not imagined your ignorance was so profound. Ouch. Oh. Well, what is the significance of the three golden balls, then? That has some special meaning. Hmm. That is entirely unimportant here, dear madam. Irrelevant, even. You mean you don't know? <laughs> How does Sherlock Holmes not know? You know who knows? Freaking Iris, that's who knows. Her name's Iris, right? I, I can't already forgot enough. Watson, Watson knows. What sort of things there are on these shelves here? Crockery, footwear, clocks, and watches. Almost anything you care to imagine. Those are forfeited items offered for sale by the pawnbroker. What does that really mean, though? When you pawn or collinquently pop an item, the broker loans you money against its worth. He stores item for an agreed period of time, at which the loan must be repaid, if not. He is free to display it in his shop for sale, at a price of his choosing. Oh, yes. Uh, now you've explained it, I'm noticing little price tags on everything. Of course, simply by paying the agreed interest on the loan. One can extend the period of safekeeping. Yep, and that's how they make money. They may pawn that black garb of yours without fear, my dear fellow. My treasured university uniform? Never! It embodies my student spirit! Okay, uh, here we go. Look at this. What could this lovely, big, shiny box be? That, my dear madam, is a music box. Surely you have such things in your own country? Oh my, yes, but I've certainly never seen one so large before. Shall we listen a while? Oh! Is that coming? Ah, what a sublime sound. Is it? It's like the music of angels. I've never heard anything like it before in my life. This particular specimen is of the larger variety, commonly found in public houses and restaurants. There is a metal disc inside on which the notes to be played are recorded. Simply by replacing the discs with another, any music you care to imagine can be played. Isn't it interesting the precursor to what we have now? My goodness, what a simply delightful machine! Indeed, though their popularity has waned recently with the development of the gramophone, of course. Huh. Science and technology advance at such an overwhelming pace. Like, what? Only tuppence for it? That ain't fair, and you know it. I, s I have an assumption who this is. The, ar the article is barely worth a penny, miss. I cannot offer you more. Yeah, it's her. It's her. Sounds like there's an argument brewing over by the counter. Come on, that can't be right. Have you even had a proper butcher's at it? I remember the voice I got for her, but I've seen all I need to see, young girl. Yeah, it's her. He's trying to fence. Wait, don't we know? I'm sure I recognize her. Oh, yes. It's the young lady from Mr. McGilded's trial two months ago. My name is Ginnelis John Blood. Eh, that's not the voice I had before. What was it? He's a chancer. Earns a crust among large crowds. Relieving people at their purses. Eh, I'm getting there. But it's commonly called a pickpocket. Gun! Gina Lestrade. Gun and better, you lot! <laughs> She stole the gun! Miss Lestrade, I hope you've been well. 
Who wins this fight, the Gona or Judo? Wait, is it Judo? I forget. I think it's Judo. Something's in my eye. Yeah, what? Well, you remember me then, do you? Well, I remember being completely surrounded by smoke, that's for sure. So, what are you doing in here? I, I, I gotta find a voice for this girl. Down and out, like. Oh, wait, 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 wait. That was not her saying that was it. Was it Rinosuke? No, no, it's her saying. Okay, right. Down and out, like the rest of us? Nothing to eat? Come to pop that black weasel sour coat you have? Oh my god, everyone with the coat! Who does it put my black uniform to make everyone comment on it? Ah, good day. Unless I'm much mistaken. You would be the young pickpocket who stole our experimental smoke grenade launcher. Ah, Mr. Shums! So, you have something of value to pawn, do you? Well, I'm going to see the article and I shall negotiate with Mr. Windybank on your behalf. Who the other one? I don't need no help from some stuck up D. Get, get out of my business. Go on. I'll make trouble for you. I gotta find a voice and I don't have it. As you wish, Miss Lestrade. I will happily remove myself from your presence. What was the voice? It was a bad voice is the problem. I remember it not being the, that great is the problem. He's really done it. He's gone. I'm sorry, but as I said, there really is no room for negotiation here. What is that thing he has in his hand? Some kind of metal disc? Oh, it's a music disc. And you, go on, leave me alone. Oh, Miss Lestrade, just pretend we aren't here. We shan't be offended in the slightest. Hmm. Hmm. The Sadosan can really stand her ground when she wants to. Whatever. Okay, I'm finding it, I'm finding it. Converse! Pawnbroker's uh, customer. Somehow I didn't really think you were the sort of person who'd use a pawnbroker, Miss Lestrade. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, I am, alright? I'm a Londoner just like everyone else. That a problem, is it? No, no, not at all. It's just that, well... Oh, I get it. I know what you were thinking. That thing probably don't even belong to her. Probably got it on the dive, didn't you? No, I lost that voice. Yeah, I can see you written all over your cheapy case. The hell was that cheap? Well, I, I might have been thinking something along those lines. I was! You're not going to deny it, Mr. Narahodo? Alright then, I'm just going to come out and ask you straight. Do you pawn things that you steal from other people? Well, um, I don't know how best to answer that, really, but, um... I suppose, sometimes. You're not going to deny it either, Miss Lestrade. But not this time, alright? I swear. That thing belongs to me! The disc that Mr. Windybank is holding? Perhaps we should see what it has to say about all this. That's why it came up, because of the disc. Examine him to converse. Get water in me. I got a headache for some reason. Mr. Windybank? What exactly is this metal disc that Miss Lestrade has brought in? It seems to have hundreds of tiny little bumps on its surface. Ah, uh, this is a music disc, you see. We'll use inside a music box. In a music box? What? You don't even know what a music box is? Tch, you Eastern lot ain't too savvy, eh? Nope, still don't have voice for I know what a music box is. I've just never seen one of these discs before. The small protrusions on the metal disc encode the tune to be played by the music box. Okay, I still have in my head him running up to us with a gun last episode. That was that was nuts. We simply insert the disc and set the machine going. And beautiful music plays. It's so incredible. Tell us, what tune is on this disc? Well, I am afraid I couldn't tell you that. There are so many different types of music box. You see, British made, German, Swiss... I have no way of knowing which particular machine this disc was made for. Ah, I see. And that's it, in a nutshell. I wouldn't have any customers for an item like this, even if the young lady forfeited it. 
Really, I'm already offering more than I should at a penny. That's a pack of lies. He told me he did. He said it was well. He? He who? <laughs> Never your mind. That just ain't right, that's all. That just worth good money, I know it is. Well then, you'll have to try your luck at another pawnbroker, won't you? Ah. In with Strad. He's been in before, of course. This little tattered demillion. I see. And brought some dubious article or other with her every single time, I might add. Dubious? What are you trying to say? I'm an honest customer hit me. So, is there something dubious about the disc she brought in? Well... If only it were that simple. Sorry, what do you mean? Which actually brought in was a storage ticket. Ah, a storage ticket. So... Miss Lestrade hasn't actually come to redeem an article for me today, is that right? Yeah, that's right. A girl like me has a lot of stuff with needs stone. Alright, yes, that's definitely dubious. The article in question would have been forfeited at midnight tonight. And as she gave me the ticket for it and repaid both the loan and the interest, I was obliged to return the article to her. Well, what was the article? You tell us, Mr. Windybank. The little scamp is wearing it, ma'am. The coat. It's the overcoat that she redeemed. Oh! What? What's wrong with it? It fits, don't it? I mean, it's mine, so of course it does. So, what about the disc, then? How does that come into all this? Ah, oh, the disc is something else. A new article to pawn, if the girl and I can agree on a price. New article to pawn. I'm confused. I thought you said that Miss Lestrade brought in a storage ticket today. It's really quite simple. Yes, the child brought me a storage ticket and the money owed to it, as you say. For this heavy black coat, which you returned to her care, as I'd understand it. That's right, yes. And rather unsurprisingly, as soon as the little ragamuffin put the thing on, she went rifling through the pockets. Oh, you mean... Don't you know it's rude to stare at a lady? Ah, oh, I see. So it came from the pocket of the overcoat, did it? If you mean this disc, then yes, exactly, ma'am. And she immediately tried to pawn it. For quite a high price as well. This is all rather suspicious, I think. Give it up. I'm just trying to pawn something like anyone else would. Mr. Stroud, may I ask who deposited the overcoat here in the first place? Um, well, uh, me. It doesn't really appear to be your size. Me old man! It's me old man, ain't it? Is it, Mr. Stroud? Yes, this is all rather suspicious. He's being pretty sus. Oh? Okay, something's happening. Out of my way, please. Okay, who is it? Oh, this is a guy. Who's this picture at, uh, picture postcard English gentleman? Go with the voice I just used. Good day to you, ladies, gentlemen. What's your problem, eh? There's no problem, as long as you remove yourself. I have m a matter to discuss with the proprietor. And if you intend to make a problem of it, I shall see you outside, little girl, for the hiding you deserve. Ooh, look, ain't it obvious? I ain't done talking with him yet. You think you're such a gent? You should know how to how to wait in line. Hmm. Well, you are impudent, little brat, aren't you? As well as a pickpocket. Huh? Well, who are you? I didn't know who I am. 
The question is, how do you not know who I am? You haven't this courtesy even to remember the faces of your victims, it seems. What? What? You mean, uh, from you? Broker? Um, yes, sir! <laughs> I believe this filthy pickpocket thief has uh, just redeemed an article from you, no? Yes, yes, um... The article in question belongs to me. I demand for it to be returned at once. Oh my! How, how good timing! That's it, I. Why are you trying to pull? Give me back my overcoat, you wastrel! And needless to say, any music discs, um, any music box dicks, too, that uh, dicks, any music box dicks, 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 dicks. Okay, do it again, do it. Any music box discs, too. No, you, you can't have it. You just can't. It's me old man's. Or it was. Now it's mine. Goodness, Mr. Natahoto. This is a very awkward situation. Yes. I think we should hear both sides of the story in a little more detail. Alright. Converse. The gentleman's accusation. Miss Lestrade, is what the gentleman is saying... What do you think? It's all lies, ain't it? Obviously. I swear in my life. I ain't never laid eyes on that dandy before. Let's hear it out now, you little ragamuffin. You stole it, didn't you? That ticket you brought in here just now? No, I swear. I swear to God. It was barely an hour ago. I was walking along the street, minding my own business. When this little gutterling ran into me. I knew at once what had happened. I've been robbed yet again, I thought to myself. Those wretched pickpockets. Yet again? Well, yes, as you can see, I am a man of impeccable style. This isn't the first time that I've been targeted by these backslum scoundrels. What's with this pose? Now then, relinquish my overcoat. Yeah. Come along now, Miss Lestrade, give the good gentleman his coat back. If you're going to cause trouble, I shall have no tr choice but to call the police. Hold on! Why does that one think it's me? Just look at this dandy coat, and you think I'm the dodgy one? I'm sorry, but no one's going to believe you. Well, what about evidence? Yeah. Where's your evidence that I've stolen someone, huh? Come on, let's see it. Oh, I have evidence, naturally. You what? Evidence. Evidence that the article Miss Lestrade redeemed actually belongs to this gentleman? Of course, we need only consult Mr. Wendy Banks of Ledger to know the truth. We'll be able to look at the name of the person who deposited the article in the first place. Good point! Yes, brilliant! Brilliant! I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid that won't be possible. Oh! I never ask customers' names. That's a strict policy of mine. But why not? Well now, as you can imagine, some of my customers have circumstances to consider. A great many of them prefer to maintain their anonymity. Yes, I see. But then, how can you know if an article belongs to the person asking to redeem it? Oh, it's quite simple. The receipt. Good sir. Might I trouble you for the watchword associated with the article in question? Of course. It's... Bananas. Professor. Okay. Yes, that's right. That and all the evidence we need. This gentleman is the rightful owner of the article, without doubt. A watchword? Interesting. Then didn't she use the watchword as well? So, about these watchwords, Mr. Windybank. As I just explained, I never ask cu customers' names when they deposit items with me. There are many reasons why. Certain customers would like to keep their activities secret. 
That wasn't exactly a subtle glance at Mr. Sholmes now, was it? Great detectives have no dark secrets, none at all. Yes, well, anyway, that's why I always ask for a watchword whenever I accept a new article. In many ways, it's like the secret combination of numbers used to unlock a, a vault. The date of deposit, a description, and a watchword uniquely identify each item. And of course, then I give the storage ticket to the customer. When someone comes to redeem something, I ask for the ticket and the watchword. And if that someone tells you the correct watchword, you return the article? That's right, sir. Yes. Just as soon as the requisite fee is paid. So why did she pay the fee? And I have supplied you with the information you require already. But for the avoidance of doubt, the article in question is an overcoat. Deposited two months ago on 15th of February. With a watchword of Professor. All perfectly correct information, sir. Is it McGill's coat? But, but how? Really, this is beyond a joke now. There is no further room for doubt. Nah. Who do we talk to now? Talk to him. Talk to him. Oh, I guess we're talking to him. Alright. Talk to him. Talk to him. The guy. Picture per... Picture postcard gentleman. Excuse me, but who are you? Hmm. One would expect the inquirer to introduce himself first. Though clearly you are not British, so perhaps our ways of, are foreign to you. Oh, sir, yes, we're from the Empire of Japan. We're studying here. Oh, yes, Japan. I've heard talk of the place. <laughs> what the fudge? Its inhabitants live on some fiery brown-colored soup, dressed up with exotic spices. You might be thinking of somewhere else. And what was that theatrical gestulation there? Perhaps anyway, if you are a gentleman, sir. You offer your own name first, before inquiring about the name of another. Of course, yes. I'm Ryunosuke Narahoda. I'm a lawyer. Well, a student of law, really. My name is Susato Mikatoba, and I am, um, Mr. Narahodo's assistant. I see. My name is Benedict. Yes, Egbert Benedict, son of a bitch! <laughs> also, it's Egbert. I can't believe they didn't go with Egbert. Egbert? Son of a son of a bitch. These names, these names. All right, all right. My name is Benedict. Yes, Egert Benedict. Enchanté. He's so refined in how he holds himself and how he speaks, but that name is suspicious. Now to the matter at hand. My overcoat. Return it at once to someone with the style to carry it off. Every move he makes, every breath he takes, I can't stand watching him. <laughs> oh my god! Such a reference! May it fit him? So, let that be an end to the matter. And thank you for your custom, Mr. Eggert. Benedict, sir? Oh my god, oh my god. Powers. With such reasonable rates of interest, I am... I may even decide to come back. Uh, Tch, here's why I hate grown-ups. It's because I'm a diver. Everyone thinks that makes me a liar. And the contents of the coat pockets, if you please, broker? But of course, sir. Here's the disc for you. Well, if she hurried up, she wouldn't have been in trouble here. Just this one? Pardon, sir? I was expecting another, uh, that is, I deposited another. Another disc? Oh, um, oh dear. I forgot to inform you, sir, that what was deposited with me was merely the overcoat. The disc happened to be in one of the pockets, but I was completely unaware of it until now. 
So, Kathleen, you're hiding more of what's rightfully mine, are you? Says who, eh? I don't know nothing about it. Hmm. Very well. Then I shall bid you farewell. Say goodbye to style. Wait a minute, that disc. It's mine. Oh, she went right for him. Ah, oh, what, what do you think you're doing, you little tramp? You've, you've drawn blood, you filthy animal. How? Oh my, yes, there's blood on the disc. Oh, because it's metal, aren't it? It's because of those sharp little bumps. That man must have scratched his finger on them. I found it first, all right. I mean, it belonged to me, my, my old man. Oh my god, Gina. You're not having it. How are you? You take it. What? Me? If I hang on to it, I'll have it off me again. So you keep out of it. Miss Lestrade, I... Why is this just so important to her? Music disc has been added to the court. What if it's added to the court record? Metal disc used to play music in a mechanical music box. The piece of music, which remains unidentified, is stored on disc by means of small protrusions. You there, in the black livery. Hand that disc to me at once, please. No, don't. He's lying. Grown ups are lies. Ugh. What do I do now? Am I going to resolve this? Music box! Look at Mr. Windybank watching Dills, you know, over his shop. There are still so many things I'm curious about. But somehow I don't really feel like this is the right time to be browsing. Dang it! Calming this fraught situation must be our first priority. I'm fairly certain that we can find just the great thing we need among the articles here in the shop. That's what I was clicking on! Apparently it's not that. Is it Sholmesy? Let's talk to Sholmesy. Uh, Mr. Sholmes, what are you examining with such keen interest here? As you enjoy a bar of caramel, I see. Hmm? So? You found me at last, Mr. Nadahodo. Sorry? After that young pickpocket sent me on my way, I was forced to lurk in the shadows. Cruelly ostracized, as the rest of you partook in this jovial atmosphere of fellowship. I had nothing to occupy my mind. It was too ashamed to let a society see what my downfall had done to me. So feigning mock interest, I pretended to examine the tedious trinkets in this desolate place. Lost, as you shrewdly observed, gnawing on the only friend I have left. The seven percent solution of caramel. Now I want a candy bar. I haven't had one in like a year. Pray, do you claim to understand the depths of my despair, Miss Narodo? But how could you? Oh, so lonely. So desperately lonely. Then why on earth didn't you rejoin the conversation? Things have gone from bad to worse here, you know? Yes, I overheard much of your conversation. Or rather, in my cravings for human contact, my eyes devoured every word that was uttered. You really were sad, weren't you? Poor Mr. Sholmes. I feel simply awful for you. It would seem that my inferences are correct. Oh, surely you're not about to tell us. That you've solved the entire case once again. My dear madam, sometimes I wonder. Were my genius for deduction to be commoditized? How much could I pawn it for? It seems Mr. Sholmes has had another of his flashes of inspiration. But who knows if it will help to resolve the situation be between Miss Lestrade and the mysterious gentleman. My head is killing me. Ugh. Let us listen to the deduction. Well, Miss Lestrade, it would appear you find yourself in something of a predicament. <laughs> Where the blue blazer have you been, eh? Pardon? When the ladies in trouble, Drew Jen's supposed to be there to help. Straight away! Not an hour later. Harsh! And who, pray tell, are you? Hmm. Mr. Eckert Benedict. 
You have, in my eyes, a veritable encyclopedic array of curiosities about your person. Nevertheless, there are two immovable conclusions I have drawn. I beg your pardon? The first is this. The true reason for your visit to this pawnbrokery today is something you have not yet revealed. <laughs> and the second is this. A considerable crime is in contemplation, one you will orchestrate with intent to steal a vast sum of money. Well, Mr. Benedict, what say you to my deductions? How? He's turned as white as a hard-boiled egg! It would seem that once again Mr. Shelms has made a flawless detection. Because who do you think you are, sir? Ah, oh, yes, I hoped. That is precisely the paint expression I was looking for. We're about to do deduction! We got time. So, shall we begin? The time has come for yet another Herlock Sholmes's logic and reasoning spectacular. Only Iris does it well, though. The great deduction. The game is afoot! What's he gonna get right? What's he gonna get wrong? Conclusion. Part one, mysterious man's aim. Well, why did skip that? First of all, we must ask ourselves on what business you ventured to this prom robbery today. You claim to have followed this pickpocket here, having had the redemption ticket stolen from you on the street. But that is most certainly a lie. The real truth is something quite different. As revealed by that which you hold in your hand. Yes, what brought you to this shop in the first place is the... Staff recruitment flyer. No! A piece of paper in your hand is a staff wanted advertisement from this very shop. Yet even the most unobservant one would soon realize that a man of your appearance has no need for such employ. In other words, there's some ulterior motive for your actions. I got him! Wrong reason, but I got him. A.G. A.G. Hmm. Who was that? The cane which you un unwittingly clutched to your person exhibits an incontrovertible contradiction. What other rot? Uh, I've... I've had this cane for years! The contradiction of which I speak is, of course... I'm missing... Ferule. No! It's the initial song! The end of any wacky cane would be terminated with a metal ferule to protect the wooden tip. And yet detailed analysis shows the wooden tip of this stick is to be utterly bare. Therefore, there is only one conclusion. The rod that you hold in your hand, which appears to be a walking cane, is in fact no cane at all. Whoa! Got his attention. You recall, sir, is something wrong? I well, I... And in your recoiling, you inadvertently facilitate the answer to, of the next conundrum to present itself. Namely, what is the truth behind this rod you bear? Hmm. Yes, reaction betrays the truth. The handle, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. Not the handle! From the moment I saw it, my suspicions were aroused. What walking cane demands such a stout handle? Mused I. Hmm. But of course, as I said, this is no walking cane. No, that rod. Is the broken handle of a shovel. What? <laughs> Are you insane? And now, having determined this undeniable truth, the conclusion is clear. Your true motive for coming here was to take employment at this establishment in order to excavate the ground beneath this premises. What a calculated crime you have conceived, sir. A wickedly calculated crime. Oh my god! Okay. Okay! You know... It was interesting the first time, now it's just like, damn, Shams, you're stupid. He's like observant, but wrongly observant. It's like an interesting dyslexia. 
But like, not a great one. No, Mr. Benedict, let us continue. Oh, we must expose the details of this elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. You suggest that I, a gentleman, intend to excavate the ground beneath this pawnbrokery with a broken shovel? What on earth do you propose I could expect to find there? Some long-forgotten treasure, I suppose? Save for such a fanciful theory, what possible reason could I have to do as you say? Oh, but there is ample reason. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Oh! Oh, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. What? So when we finish all this deducing, that's when we'll stop. But what the very nice case are. Let us consider what would motivate a man to infiltrate a shop such as this, and covertly dig beneath its floor. The answer is revealed by the council notice on the counter to which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. He's looking at the gun! This letter gives notice of public works to be carried out in the local area. In accordance with the enclosed plan of the upcoming sewage jury. Sewerage works. Beneath this shop runs a sewer that adjoins another, one that runs under the bank to the opposite right side of the road. This madness is utter. This madness has entered the sewers now, has it? By excavating the ground beneath our feet, you would gain access to the waterway. That flows in very close proximity to the great vault of the financial institution opposite. What are you? In summary, sir? You devised a master plan to pull off an elaborate bank robbery by dint of the underground tunnels. M master plan? <laughs> ah! Which brings us, at last, to the final chapter of this lowered scheme. With what plunder did the thief hope to make off from the underground vault of the bank? You're quite serious. Having consulted with Scotland Yard some days ago, I happen to know the answer. But naturally the answer is no secret to you, is it, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. You see, this picture postcard tells us all we need to know. A postcard of the Great Exhibition? I'm afraid you've quite lost me. Currently in the final stage of preparation, the Great Exhibition will soon be underway. And the government has provided extra funds to complete its centerpiece, the Crystal Tower. Funds that currently sit in the vault of the bank, on the other side of this road. Pardon? Yes, the considerable crime you have been contemplating. is the theft of that which sits in the vault of the bank. The special reserve funds for the Great Exhibition. Of course, that is top secret police information, so keep it under your hat, please. Wow, quite the information there! To steal the Great Exhibition's reserve funds. So what's the real reason? This does conclude Halakshom's great deduction of this pawnbroker puzzle. It's time for Ianoski to figure it out. Um, Mr. Sholmes. Well, Mr. Nadahodu? An impressively upbeat deduction for a detective racked with loneliness, would you not agree? Was it true that what you just said about the bank over the road and what it has in its vault? Indeed, though few know of its existence, it is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. Gregson told me in the strictest confidence. Oh, that was a mistake. But you just announced it to everyone here. Rather loudly, in fact. Huh. And if it's such a big secret, how would Mr. Bangdick have come to find out about it? There can be one explanation for that. Clearly it is because the man is a criminal. But what if he didn't know anything about the money in the vault? If he is a criminal, as you said, then buying a brand new shovel is... Sure, be the first thing he does now that you've revealed the secret. Oh! Or if he doesn't, maybe Mr. Wendybank will. He already has plenty of shovels here, after all. Oh my, oh my life! I assure you, I'm not so unscrupulous! Hmm. 
Hmm, well, hopefully this taught you a valuable lesson. Sensitive information must be handled with the utmost of care. Oh my god. One can never be sure that someone privy to secrets won't disclose them, and once the word is out, it's out. Perhaps I'll think twice before confiding in you next time, Mr. Sholmes. Oh, don't worry, no one needs to know about your bedwetting. An excellent idea, Mr. Narahodo, an excellent idea! <laughs> well then, Mr. Narahodo, you know what to do, I'm sure. Yes, let's listen to that great deduction again, and see if we can massage it into shape. Very well then, let us start once more from the beginning. Oh, Herlock Sholmes is magnificent. Logic and reasoning spectacular. Round two. Course correction. Hold it, Mr. Sholmes. What is his actual aim? The disc, but why is it the disc? Let's get to the first one. Here we go. Not the flyer! It's the cane, isn't it? So, by Mr. Sholmes' reasoning, Mr. Bender came here in order to apply for a job so he could dig down through the floor. Yes, in an attempt to tunnel into the sewers to gain access to the money in the vault of the bank across the road. But he wouldn't get very far with a broken shovel, would he? No, I think it's fair to say his motives lie elsewhere. The question is, where? What did bring Mr. Bendick here at this particular point in time? There! Scribbled writing! Take that. These notes were scrawled by somebody famous, and as such, are worth a considerable... That's not it! Oh, I was supposed to look at it first. The fact that you handle the paper with which they are written with gloves only proves my theory. So you came here today with the intention of pawning it as much as the broker would give you. No! No! The deduction was wanting in every way. Yes, I was wanting you to hear it. I'm quite proud of it. I find myself wanting never to he have heard it. I'm quite pained by it, in fact. Oh, uh, sorry, I'll try again. I think we're supposed to examine it first. Oops. Flip that around and examine it. I still don't quite understand why this gentleman came to Mr. Wendy Banks today. He might look like a smartly dressed man about town, but perhaps he's destitute, really. I really think that's the only explanation. I must stop thinking along those lines, Miss Naruto. Yes, I suppose you're right. Well, in that case, perhaps there's something in this pawn shop that the man was looking for. Let's look closely and see if there's anything about his person that gives us a clue. Yeah. There, examine. There we go. Oh. Look at all the scribbled notes on the back of the flyer here. Hmm. I don't believe it! What is it? Listen to what it says! Name, Gina Lestrade. Height, 5 foot 2. Green cap, scruffy waistcoat, grubby white shirt, blue satchel, ragged. It's a, de it's a detailed description of Miss Lestrade. Goodness. There's even a sketch of her in hat and all. Although if he showed it to her, she'd fire that smoke grenade launcher in his face for sure. And look, the details of the shop have been written down here, too. Wendy Banks Brokery, Baker Street, Redemption Deadline, 15th of April. Which is today's date! Why would Mr. Bendix have all that information scrawled on the paper, on the back of the piece of paper? Now we can present it! Info on Miss Lestrade, now we present. That's what we screwed up. Oops! Now it's better. Yes, what brought you to this shop is the, in the first place is the info about Miss Lestrade. Quite so, my dear fellow. It would appear that the writing and sketch on the reverse of the flyer pertain to the pickpocket Miss Lestrade and to Mr. Windybank's brokery here. Ah! You originally told us that you had merely given chase after Miss Lestrade stole the redemption ticket from you. But that, sir, is a thinly veiled lie. It is the information on the back of the flyer that led you here today, by which I mean... Here, to Windy Bank's pawnbrokery, and today, the redemption deadline of that overcoat. 
So you waited outside for the young girl, matching the description you have written down it to arrive? Huh. And you have gone to some lengths to hide the reason for your pursuit to Mr. Strad. In other words, there is some ulterior motive for your actions. Ah, right, here we go. Alright, here we go! Why would you go there? Alright, here it comes. Um, what's a fural? It's the metal cap commonly found on the end of a cane, Mr. Nadahodo. Oh, for poor people, it is a... Um, rubber... <laughs> it's a rubber stopper, or... Or... It is a tennis ball. Ah, the bit that makes the nice clacking sound on the pavement. Yes, exactly. And Mr. Sholmes is right. It appears to be missing on this cane. But it doesn't actually look broken, does it? No, it doesn't. Though the gentleman certainly did recoil when Mr. Sholmes identified the cane as suspicious. In other words, there's some secret about the cane that Mr. Bendick would rather we don't know. Okay, work your way up the shaft, up to here. Initialing. Look here, Miss Lasato. Miss Lasato. There are some letters on the handle. Ah, oh, yes. Those must be initials, I think. In the West, it's customary for people to engrave their belongings with the first letters of their names. So Herlock Sholmes would be HS, you mean? That's right. The initials on this cane, obviously. Oh. A.G. Why does it feel as though this not quite right? But Breaking through. The contradiction of which I speak is, of course, the initialing. A most astute observation, wouldn't you say, Mr. Egbert? Egbert? Benedict? Uh. We are led to believe, sir, that your initials are E.B. Yet in a most possessive manner, you have in your grasp a cane bearing the initials A.G. An incontrovertible contradiction indeed, would you not agree? No, uh, you're, you're wrong. Uh, this cane isn't... You said before that you'd had that cane for years. Uh, that spin. So don't try to tell us that you just borrowed it from a friend or found it in the park. In short... Though you hold yourself to be a gentleman, you have withheld your true name. Ooh. Yeah, what's that sound about? Hmm. Right, here we go, recoil. Yes, not the handle. What is it? Let's consider the bare bones of what's happened here. Miss Lestrade redeemed that fine-looking coat overcoat. And now a mysterious man has appeared, introducing himself with a fake name. And claiming that the overcoat belongs to him. But we know that he actually identified Mr. Strand from a written description. We suggest that everything else he's told us is untrue. But what we need to do here is somehow prove that the overcoat cannot possibly belong to him. He just stretched it. We heard him stretch it. Yeah, he tore it just now. Ooh, he split the seam. Oh, the seam on the shoulder there is coming apart. Look. So it is. You know, a moment ago when Mr. Bennett was surprised by something that was said, I thought I heard him make a rather strange noise. It sounded a bit like a tiny growl. But now I think it was probably the sound of this seam ripping apart. If you look closely, it does seem to be very tight fit. The sleeves are str stretched to bursting and you wouldn't have a hope of fastening it at the front. If we were to run around in it, I'm sure the whole thing would fall apart. Hmm. That I'd like to see. Sorry? How can we make Mr. Benedict run around? She's really given this some thought. I present the seam. Take that. Split seam. The split seam, which you evidently would like to conceal, is the key to understanding this riddle, you see. Ugh. Yes, because the overcoat is rather poor, obviously a poor fit. 
Having, having forced it over your broad shoulders, the seam is already breaking apart. My suspicions were aroused from the outset. When you so bo you so boldly lied about your name and so bo boldly waylaid this pickpocket, ah! this catalog of untruths has all been for one very specific reason. To steal the article that the young girl redeemed from Mr. Windybank. Ah! But what really irks me is this. The considerable crime I initially imagined has been considerably curtailed. Yep! <laughs> Don't have to that second one! To abscond with a redeemed item. So now what is the truth here? Or we must expose the, de the details of the elaborate crime you have in the planning. This is utterly absurd. Okay, there we heard Ozzy. Here we go. You suggest that I, a gentleman, designed a wee a wheeze to fill some tawdry article of ponage. Po ponage! <laughs> ponage! Ponage! Have you forgotten that I redeemed the article in the proper manner? Using the watchword. Had I not been the one to deposit it in the first place, how could I possibly have known the relevant details? Ne pas. Oh, but the watchword can be discovered. As you are only too well aware, Mr. Benedict. Ah, and your furtive glance is more telling than I could have hoped. So it's not the gun. What? Let us consider how one might come to learn a secret watchword relating to the pawned property of another. The method is revealed by the council note. Not the council note, it's the other notes. It's not the gun he's looking at, he's looking at this. The direction the direction must change rather dramatically now, I think. Yes, no more talking of tumbling into the sewers. Which is a pity, because it all sounded rather exciting. Anyway, you can't deny that this mysterious gentleman did know the watchword. Yes, Professor. If he didn't know the word, Mr. Windybank would never have allowed to redeem the article. Or looking at it another way, if you did know that word, Mr. Windybank would allow you to redeem the article whether it was yours or not. So the question is, could this gentleman have found the watchword out somehow? Notelet, there it is. Is that a picture of a kid? Look at this, Mr. Mrs. Sato. Ah, oh, it appears to be a memento for a memo from Mr. Wendybank that has he has scribbled for himself. Let's see, what does it say? Oh, Professor. Hmm. Hmm. Mr. Wendybank must make a note of the watchwords his customers give him right before their eyes. And an alarmingly clear script as well. Oh dear. I... I don't know where to look. Who knows what other secrets I might see. There it is. Note it. Take that! Blam! I thought he was looking at the gun. The method revealed by the notelet on the counter in which your eyes were inadvertently drawn. Yes, the broker here follows the same procedure whenever a customer comes to redeem an article. You know, article... He asks the customer for the watchword and notes down the response uttered on a notelet he has to hand. Then he consults his ledger and confirms whether or not the watchword matches that of the article in question. I would expect nothing less of a diligent pawnbroker. But this diligence clearly has its disadvantages. What are you talking about? It is increasingly apparent that you were present in this shop before your accusation against Miss Lestrade. In all likelihood, you followed her inside and then observed her talking to Mr. Windybank. When the diligent broker made a note of the watchword, as, as is his common practice, you observed him writing the word Professor on the notelet beside the ledger. Hm. 
And that, sir, was the master plan you devised to steal the pond article from the young Miss Lestrade. Hmm. Master plan? Alright, the last part. Why would you go to such lengths to redeem that particular article from this pawnbroker? Are you quite serious? An ill-fitting overcoat hardly seems to justify the effort, much less a worthless music box disc. But naturally, you had very good reason to make them yours, didn't you, Mr. Benedict? I have no idea what you're talking about. Allow me to present a rather interesting piece of evidence. Okay, so it's not this. So what is it? The articles we're talking about are the overcoat and the music box disc that was in one of the pockets. Which, according to Mr. Winniebank, isn't even worth a penny. And yet this man went to such lengths to steal them. Why? I wonder if perhaps we already have the evidence we need to explain to Miss Nada Hutto. Could we? Really? I'd better have a thorough look through all the evidence we've collected so far. <laughs> Let's present my armband! The disc. The disc. Oh, we got a look at the disc. Whoop, precisely was your intention with that, Mr. Narahodo. Just following the natural progression of deduction, sometimes the truth hurts. Well, the truth is, you do not have the turn of observation of deduction. Did that hurt? Yes, a lot. I guess I had to examine it first. All right, let's examine the disc. This man has used some fairly high-handed measures to try to get his hands on the overcoat and the disc. He certainly doesn't want either of their monetary value, though. Or their monetary value. Still, they must be of value somehow, to someone. Hmm, this is the last piece of the puzzle. I'd better have another look through the evidence and... Yeah, we have to actually look at the evidence. That was the problem. Examine. The blued. Look at all the little bumps on the disc. They're so tiny. Yes, the protrusions are called pins, and they pluck the teeth of the comb to make no notes. And just on the edge, there's a small amount of blood. Yes, the blood of the mysterious Mr. Eggert Bennett. Benedict. When Mr. Strong tried to grab the disc from him, the pin scratched his fingers, it seems. Like when you're grating some daikon radish and accidentally cut your finger. Ouch! Just thinking about it hurts! and puts me off eating radish. Ah! <gasps> there it is! Yeah, it is for McGilded! We knew it! McGilded! This is probably what he sold her- what- why she- he- la 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 la. This is probably what he did to get her to work for him. With a smoke grenade. From McGilded. Oh, there's a little scrap of paper stuck up onto the reverse side of the disc. Look! And a scribbled word or two. It looks like somebody's name. Hmm. Or McGilded. M McGilded? It couldn't be. But it is, Mr. Nadahodo. A name I shall never forget for as long as I live. But why? Why is his name on this? Now he knows something about it. On the reverse side is McGilded. Now present! There we go. Look at the stuff before you present it. You see, this music box disc tells us all we need to know. It wasn't her old man's, it's this. What's that on the back? It reads for Miss Miss Bleh. It reads for McGilded. Ah, uh, Mr. Magnus McGilded. Unfortunate philanthropist who perished in curious circumstances at the Old Bailey two months ago. A prominent man in London who was loanmongering demonstrated a distinct lack of scruples. Hmm. So, you're an associate of his, are you? Or perhaps a subordinate? Hmm. Mr. McGilded was a man of unusually small stature, in fact. He was precisely the right size for that overcoat you squeezed yourself into. Ugh. Your true identity remains shrouded in mystery, Mr. Eggert Benedict. But the final conclusion is crystal clear. 
The reason you came to this pawn broker today. Was to retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus McGilded. To retrieve an article left behind by the late Magnus McGilded. Huh. Ah. I like that the seam's still there, like when he spun, the seam was split. Like, wow. To acquire an item deposited by Mr. McGilded. Solved. Deduction complete! Elementary! Okay, we'll save at the next moment we can. And next time we'll see the fallout of this. Well, well, Mr. McGilded. <laughs> Mr. Magnus McGilded. Here, yep, save. That's it. Next time we will see the fallout. So that's it for now. I have fun. Hope you have fun watching. That's what's all about it. Having fun. Thanks for coming by and see you next time.